I'm Greg Avola. I'm a co-founder of Untapped. Uh, gratefully, the official social network of Monkey Cross. That's pretty phenomenal. I don't know what to say. Um, so basically, what we do in Untapped is we allow users to check in their beers and share them with their friends. Um, and once we get this thing powered up, we'll talk about some good stats that we have for that. There we go. All right. There we go. So we're talking about what we share, change what we drink. So kind of like what Matt talked about, but I'm going to talk about more about beer. So, um, oh, great updates. <laughs> if this was a Mac, it'd work fine, but now it's Microsoft's problem. <laughs> All righty. Okay, so who, who am I and why am I talking? So I'm also I'm the co-founder of Untapped. Um, I'm the CTO. I do all the back-end development um, for Untapped. I live in New York City, um, but I'm born and raised in Boston, so I'm a big fan of the Red Sox. So if any Red Sox fans out there, we're not the right country, though, for this, I don't think. <laughs> I specialize in PHP, jQuery, and MySQL, which is the stack for Untapped. Uh, we use CodeIgniter for all of our framework. Um, and my... Uh, my nice thing is a fame. I don't think this show exists in the UK. Maybe it does. Man versus food. Does it exist? So I was on for nine seconds of this show once. My friend did a, uh, a competing challenge with uh, the host, and I got to say this line that was horrible. I don't know if there's a lot of pizza left on that plate, but I'm not sure if they can finish it. That was my line, my nine seconds, and it was awesome. Um, so that was my claim to fame. So Rolls Untapped, uh, pretty much it's the four square for beer. That's what's been coined by uh, individuals around the globe. Um, and that's really what we are. Um, we launched in 2010, which uh, in October, we've been around for about a year and a couple months now. We're a team of three. I'm the co-founder, my other co-founder is in Los Angeles. Um, and we have one person in Boston, Massachusetts, doing business development. Um, we have over 120,000 registered users. Um, last time we did this talk, we had 56,000 users. That was three months ago. So we are rapidly expanding um, our user base. 4.3 million check-ins in about a year and about three months. We're at 2.3 in October of last year. So another big raise. We just uh, have a native app that came out recently, which allows users to um, upload photos. 175,000 beer-related photos. I stress that, beer-related photos. Um, have been uploaded in our system as well. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a mobile web platform and a native platform, so we're on Android and iPhone, but you can use it on your BlackBerry if you have a BlackBerry, I'm sorry, and, um, and other uh, platforms. Social integration with Twitter, Facebook, and Foursquare. Of course, you can have an application these days without having those, those integrated. And finally, the best part, social achievements. Everyone wants to be granted the ability to get badges for drinking certain beer, which is part of our service. I want to talk about something today that we just recently launched that I, I think that you guys will like as, as well as breweries. But just like Foursquare, we have the ability now to have users, breweries claim their page on, on tap. And that, what that lets them do is it gives them the ability to hit these three fundamental features, which I think are awesome because it relates to big data. First thing, it allows you to see insights, how many people are checking into your beer. If you're a brewery, this stuff is really important because you don't have to spend those marketing dollars to see where your beer is being drank, the demographics around it. We provide that for you in an analytics chart. The second thing is the biggest problem with beer is there's multiple names for every single beer you're having. So you go to a bar, they're, they're wrong on the bar, they're, maybe they're right in the bottle. So it allows you to set this, the standards straight for what your beer is going to be like on the surface. And finally, the best feature is it allows consumers to directly talk to the breweries. In America, we have a three-tier system. We have breweries, distributors, and the consumers. So if a brewery wants to sell to a bar, they've got to go to a distributor first, which then sells it to the bar, which then the consumer gets. So if you want to contact the brewery, you can do it on Twitter. But now if you follow a brewery on Untapped, you can immediately connect with them when you check into a beer. They can ask you, how did you like it? Was it great? And then you can kind of talk and have that kind of communication back and forth. That's really cool. So we launched this on January 17th. Uh, I already have 500 breweries signed up for this, so we're about half a month in. 
Um, so we're really, really happy about that. 420 international real breweries. If you're a home brewer, you can still claim your own brewery too and do that from an analytic perspective. So it's, and the most important part, it's all free. So you can't go wrong with that. So that's really awesome. So just like the chicken and the kitten, I want to talk a little about what is being shared versus what is being checked into. It's still a pull from the last 60 days of activity on Untap. On the left-hand side, you can see the top shared beers in America. All of them are fantastic beers. If you haven't had them, I'm really sorry for you. On the right-hand side, even spelled Yangling wrong, that's fantastic. Um, on the right-hand side, it's the top checked-in beers. And these beers, with the exception of the top one, are very macro-oriented, which are everyone is able to actually get these stuff wherever they, wherever they go, gas stations, local pubs. So you can see that everyone wants to be cool and drinking the craft beer on the left-hand side and sharing that with your friends. But really what they're drinking, they're drinking Bud Light. And, and they don't want anyone to know about that. So it's a really interesting paradigm to think about who shares what and what they actually check into. So this, this kind of slide shows that where you're really a Bud Light drinker, but you really say that you drink Lagunitas and Bells. Something's not right here. I don't think you're right. Look at the UK, though. You guys are actual geniuses because you check into what you're actually drinking. Um, you guys have, well, I mean, I don't think really Newcastle is really not an English beer per se, but um, I mean, you, you guys are actually drinking what you're actually checking into. So it shows the kind of paradigm about what you guys think is important from a mindset of actually sharing what you check in instead of trying to not be the chicken and be the kitten, you know? So that's a really interesting stats as well. Just like any social service, um, we have prospered on the weekends. Um, and so this kind of graph for us is, we laugh at this all the time when we see this, is this is how the check-in and the sharing over time looks for untapped. During the week, nobody does anything, but then we hit the weekends, we get these peaks and valleys. The big spike in the middle, if anyone can guess what day that is, that was New Year's Eve which was the largest check-in day on Untapped in the history, with about 50,000 check-ins happening over that day. Um, and this is, all, this is a graph of, of sharing over time. So every day we, we keep track of what gets shared, what doesn't get shared. So everyone likes to share stuff on the weekends, but no one wants to share stuff during the day because they're afraid their employees will see it. So I think it's a great draft of, uh, of, of what's going on with the sharing on Untapped. I want to trace a little bit over to our gamification element on Untapped and why we think this is really important for consumers out there. Um, what is gamification? Everyone knows kind of what that is from a perspective of badges, achievements. It drives people to try different things, um, you know, friendly competition. Um, and basically, when you're at a bar and you see a beer that's part of a badge on Untapped, your mindset changes. You get to see, um, you know, oh, I didn't have that instead of having my usual because I want to try something different. And it really only takes one because once you get into that kind of mindset, you're having it all the time. This is a study that we pulled from uh, Dogfish Head, which we did a badge for them called our Ancient Ale series. And what that, that did was the badge was given to people that checked into three different other Asian ales, and they have five total, and they're spread out through, throughout the, uh, the calendar year of 2011. So as you can see on this graph, the middle, the, the spike there is when we release the badge. And after that, the best part is the sustainability of this badge. People are still checking into it after the badge was the first day. And you're going to see the difference between the graphs on the left versus the right. And we're, we're providing a lot of more revenue for the for dog we shed. But we're also increasing the awareness of users to go out there and try this beer. And that's pretty interesting to see that a badge would drive someone to go out there and spend a $20 US dollar on on, this, on these bottles just for a badge. The best way I can describe it is like a giant panda and you're leaving a carnival and everyone sees that panda on your back, they don't want to carry that panda, but they're like, oh, I want that panda real badge, really, really bad. So that's really what a badge looks like on Untap and why it has so much effort. Another great stat here is, is the macro versus micro consumption. In the US, we kind of categorize beers by macro brewery, which produces approximately 6 million barrels a year for some microbreweries ending less than that. And you can see over time, the numbers for the amount of check-ins, uh, this was 2011 data, has increased significantly over, over the, um, the, well, it's, it's just a micro or macro on the right-hand side, but the micro on the left is increasing to, you know, 10, 20,000 per month over the macro, which is going down. So people are actually expanding their, their taste palettes, trying new things and kind of getting away from the usual kind of material. 
the last thing I want to talk about today is about our, our performance stack because this is a technology conference, obviously. We really want to show off what we do from the back end to make all this data come together. Um, our mobile apps are all based on HTML5 technology. And the best thing about this, this technology is that it enables you to use what you have already are good at and expand upon it. HTML5 has tons of great features and great um, products that enable you to quickly develop mobile solutions without having to, to learn different codes and different um, products and whatnot. So the, the great thing about HTML5 is that it's supported by all modern browsers, with the exception of Internet Explorer in the version 6 and 7 and 8, and I think 9. But um, um, so modern browsers, as I say. So um, you know, we use it extensively on our web and our mobile applications. So that's where our, our first uh, framework is. But there, when we came out with our native application, we had a lot of problems with developing from mobile or native. Uh, there are a lot of pros and cons. I mean, number one, pro is really easy to develop a mobile application on HTML5. You know the language, HTML, CSS is very important and very easily readable, uh, and it's, it's fantastic. So it's really easy to do. It's very cheap. You don't have to hire multiple developers and iOS developers. I was talking to Matt last night, and we were talking about how if you're an iOS developer, you can charge whatever the hell you want because it's in high demand. So it's very cheap to make these mobile apps. Multiple platforms, one code. So you can develop from multiple, si multiple phones using the same code for all those platforms. You have some access to native, native features like geolocation, but it kind of ends there. And it's really fast, and you can up make updates really fast. Everyone gets updates on the same day. You don't have to re-download or resubmit to an app store. You can update quickly. The big thing that we have a problem on the con side is the lack of exposure and the knowledge barrier. The web app terminology is not common knowledge yet. Telling a user you're on a web, they're confused instantaneously. The first question anyone asks you if you have a service, do you have an app? You say, yes, I do. It's in the web. OK, so I'm going to go to the app store and download it. No, no, you're going to go open up Safari, and you're going to type this into the browser. You already lost them. You already lost them right there. So that's a big, big problem to get to there. The other thing, too, is the camera and the, and the other, other kind of uh, native features. You don't have access to that stuff on the web platform. You can't upload files uh, on a typical mobile phone. So what is the solution for us, and how do we get to native? We use a product called PhoneGap, which we think is amazing and enables us to deploy multiple versions of our app to multiple platforms. So how does this work for us? This is the app on the right-hand side. Uh, for us, it looks very awesome. It's all built in HTML5 and CSS3 and JavaScript, and then ported using PhoneGap. It allows us to develop all of our stuff in that native language that we're good at, and then migrate it to native. Um, it also allows us to put in multiple app stores. So we can go to Android Market, we can go to the App Store, uh, we're all in one spot. And the best part is it has access to native components. So we can access geolocation correctly from the GPS now. We can access camera. We can pull in contact information. We can access network con connection components. So it's a really good um, uh, solution for us. And it was really easy to develop. Why phone gap? It's open source and free. It recently got acquired by Adobe, but the product is, has been changed to callback. Um, but it's open and source and free, so that's, that's a good reason altogether. Use your existing knowledge to actually build these templates. You don't have to hire multiple people. You can just go out and do it yourself. And the best part is that they have a thriving community that does these things and has questions. They have a Google Groups page. You can get answers really fast. So it's a really good solution. But of course, with all great power comes great responsibility. And you must understand that there are lessons you need to be learned when you're developing for mobile applications. The number one thing that I've learned is that you have to build your app as an app and not as a website. And what I mean by that is that most people build websites with module loading screens. A lot of times when you're on native or you're on an app, you have to understand that stuff needs to take place in the background. So when you're accepting a friend on untapped, it happens instantaneously for the user. But on the background, it does all the processing it needs to do. You never want to show up a loading screen for every single action. Otherwise, it doesn't really make much sense. Understand the different design platforms before building. You can't use this example on the left for your Android version because if you have a bottom bar on the native on the on Android, you have problems because you touch the, the back buttons and all that stuff in the bottom. So we transition that to a more top bar. So understanding the design patterns is very important. And then finally, test, test, test. When you make a mistake on JavaScript, you miss a semicolon, your app does not work at all. 
You can't resubmit to the store with Apple because um, what happens is you have to wait like five business days to get that done, and that doesn't really work too well. So, so that's pretty much it for, for my talk. I don't know if we have time for question and answer, but I would say no. But it, it, please, uh, you know, if, if you're checking in beers tonight, he's untapped. <laughs>